Well, welcome everybody. You have joined the CERAL Project virtual public meeting. Um, and if you've joined us and you're on video, you should be able to see a cover slide. Um, I have my screen shared that says the name of the project, our forest and project website. If I can get just a couple nods that you're seeing the present, the ultimate presentation, that'd be good. OK, great. Thanks, Martin. Two thumbs up. <laughs> I'm going to not really be able to see you all here in a moment, um, but I do want to I want to walk through how tonight, how we're going to structure tonight. I just lost one of my screens. Hold on, technical difficulty for me already. Bear with me. There we go. OK. OK, so you should see my welcome slide now. And again, welcome to everybody. As many of you that have joined us tonight already know, I'm Katie Wilkinson. I'm the Forest Environmental Coordinator and the Serial Team Leader. We're going to start today's meeting ultimately with opening remarks from Forest Supervisor Jason Kaiken. When he's finished, I will be presenting an overview of the CERAL project and the draft environmental impact statement. The majority of our time this evening, we're going to set aside for questions and answers because the main objective of meeting together tonight is so that we can share some information with you, but most importantly, be able to provide any necessary clarifications you may need to best enhance your detailed review of what we've proposed. If you'd like to participate and ask a question, you can either use the chat feature on the Teams in the, in the Teams meeting and type that question directly into that chat area, or you can use the raise your hand option. And Curtis Kwame is going to be moderating the question and answer period, and so he'll be watching for raised hands. Um, also, if if that's not working for you, you know, just speak up in the lull. We are going to do our best to ensure that anybody that wants to speak um, or has a question has the and has the desire to do so we'll get that opportunity to do that. Um, this is only our second virtual open house, so we're relatively new at these technical things, um, but um, we're hoping for the best and just be patient with us if we have some, some hiccups here. If you do, do experience any technical difficulties, Jake Baker is going to be monitoring his email, so you can shoot him an email. His email address is jacob.baker at usda.gov and he should be able to help troubleshoot any problems you're having and if all else fails we are recording this meeting the entirety of the meeting it'll be posted within the week on the project website and this powerpoint presentation that you'll see tonight will also be made available on the project website um, if if at the end of the meeting there's anything that requires additional follow-up we're going to document those needs and summarize them at the end of the meeting so everyone's clear on how we'll share that additional information and we are also, we have in our back pocket, we're prepared to provide a second meeting opportunity next Thursday if we need to do so, but we are going to determine the necessity of that additional meeting um, based on whether or not there's still active questions happening at 7 p.m. and if there's still good dialogue happening. So we'll stay tuned and just know that we're prepared to do that. Um, let's see what else. So I think that's all of the housekeeping. And with that, Jason, if you're ready, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and hand it over to you. All right, good evening. I hope everybody can hear me. Can somebody give me a thumbs up? I lost audio uh, the other day or late, earlier today. So, um, so you know, I wanted to start with just a big thank you. A couple of thank yous. One is uh, thanks to everybody for, for joining here today. I am really appreciate um, you all coming on to this meeting. Uh, you know, there it's we're in the new year. All of a sudden, we're in 2022. I hope everybody had a good holiday season. Um, and here we are talking about fire um, when there's snow on the ground, and that's a good thing um, that we have some snow up high. I do hope folks didn't have any issues at your your house. I know folks were without power for quite some time and may have incurred other other damage, but. Uh, uh, my best to all of you on that. And then I want to thank the team. Um, and when I say team, I do not mean uh, the Forest Service team. I mean the big team, which is really all of you on this call and beyond. Um, we we had a team on our on our forest, and that uh, um, that was our our main um, interdisciplinary team. But we had YSS Yosemite Stanislaus Solutions as a, a large component. 
And then we had a lot of engagement, interaction, comments uh, from members of the public, um, thoughts that uh, made us uh, reconsider things and, and create other alternatives uh, to be able to, to look at um, what we're doing and why we're doing it. And so I just want to thank all of you for that engagement. Uh, these are public lands. Um, they, they impact uh, everybody on this call and, uh, and many others. So thanks for, for being a part of, of this project uh, um, uh, creation and getting to where we are and where we'll end up as well. And so, so then to get into the project, you know, we're here to talk about the social and ecological resilience across the landscape project. And that, that acronym is uh, CERO, which uh, we have to have a, um, an acronym uh, all, at all times. But, um, but you know, wh why are we here? What, what brings us to this conversation? And, you know, you can hopefully see my background right now. And you're probably wondering, why am I showing the entire Sierra Nevada's um, as my as my background and and if you look close and I'll step out of the way here in just a second it's the fire history kind of by decade from the 80s 90s 2000s and then the last 10 years and and it shows quite a drastic difference as you go through time um, in the in the last 10 years um, we've had 4.8 million acres of Nevada's uh, burn and, and wild and fire and unplanned um, fire on the landscape. Uh, that's that's pretty significant. Um, that's uh, um, that's almost as much fire on the um, well. Sorry, in 2020 and 2021 alone, there's almost as much fire in the Sierra Nevadas as the entirety of the 80s, 90s, and 2000s combined. So I'll say that again. There's nearly as much fire that occurred in the Sierra Nevadas in 2020 and 2021 as the 80s, 90s, and 2000s combined. That's a big deal. That's a large number. Um, and, you know, on, on one hand, uh, the number of acres burned in the last 10 years is not, not even the number of acres on a historic context, kind of pre-1850s, on what would have burned on an annual basis, and yet the impacts of that fire on the landscape is significantly more. Uh, the intensity in which uh, areas are burning, uh, the vegetation impacts are, are more significant uh, than, um, than what history would show us. And so what do we do about that? Um, how, do we, how do we chart a new course? Um, and, and that course is not, not relegated to the Sierra Nevadas alone. It is a west-wide issue. It, it's really beyond uh, the western United States. Um, and, and that goes to forest health. Forest health is a uh, is a key component of what we're going to be talking about here today. Um, what's in the draft environmental impact statement uh, that hopefully you all have had a had a chance to read, um, or at least peruse, and uh, and what we're again talking about here today. The other stat I'll leave you with is the Dixie Fire. Um, just that single fire in 2021 um, burned more acres than all acres burned in the 1980s. So one fire burned more than 10 years worth of fires in the entire Sierra Nevada. Nearly as many acres as burned in the entire 1990s. Um, and, and keep in mind, the 87 complex was in the Sierra Nevadas in the 80s. Um, and, and that one fire was more than all of that combined. So, so when, we, when we look at that, um, the impacts to habitat, um, wildlife, to fish, to to plant habitat um, has been changed. Our impacts to communities from homes being being burned directly to um, uh, debris flows after fires to infrastructure uh, from uh, water flumes to power lines to um, uh, roads all have been impacted uh, by fire or the after effects. Also our water supply, our, our potable water supply that we all use in our communities as well as for agriculture has also been impacted um, and so all of that speaks to this isn't uh, this isn't one agency's issue alone. This is all of our our problem to um, to see and then to um, work to resolve. And that's that's where shared stewardship comes in. That's uh, that's really the the place that we are as the Forest Service is looking um, beyond our walls, beyond folks that are wearing the uniform that I'm wearing today, to help us identify issues and solutions to those issues. And and so that's really um, what brought us here to this project is that fire history, those impacts, the things that we all care about and, and looking to find a new course. 
And so this project specifically came out of conversations uh, um, with, with Barney Gant, and, uh, who is our former deputy regional forester here in, in California and Hawaii and Outline Islands, um, otherwise known as Region 5 or the Pacific Southwest Region. Um, so he, he had a couple collaboratives come together and, and he, he encouraged those collaboratives, uh, Yosemite Stanislaus Solutions being one of them, to go out and look uh, um, at the, the landscape that, they're, um, that they care about and help identify a landscape that needs treatment. Um, YSS came back with, uh, with generally this area. We modified it slightly based on conversations to get to watershed boundaries, but it was YSS coming forward with saying this is an important landscape based on those communities uh, being uh, potentially impacted by fire um, habitat because there's a lot of California spotted owl um, habitat within this landscape. Water supplies for ag use as well as uh, municipal use and so forth. Um, and so that, that conversation um, was also develop solutions together. Um, don't have the Forest Service go into a, a room and come out with a product uh, um, later on. And so, so we've been working the last uh, 18 months or so. I'm trying to remember when we started. Maybe it's been a few more months than that. I'm working with YSS um, and, and others to help create uh, the proposed action um, that you'll see here today. And that, that, that's because this is all about working together across the landscape. So I want to thank everybody for getting us to that, that place. And so then I'm going to say, um, once we identified the location of, uh, of this project area, we had to come up with a name. And the, and the name says it all. Um, this project is about the social and ecological resiliency across the landscape. This is not, not simply about uh, our communities. It's not simply about uh, the habitat. It's not simply about water supply or recreation opportunities that, that we all enjoy in this landscape. It's about all of it together. Um, and so if we're, if we're looking at that large swath of uh, interested parties and um, uh, and different uh, values for folks, um, it's going to take a lot, um, especially when we're looking at 119,000 odd acres across the landscape, which is a which is a pretty sizable um, which is a pretty sizable area. And so, so how do we do that? How do we incorporate all of those values on a large landscape that's hard for the the human brain to really understand all at once? Um, we do that by by a using the best available science. Um, we we leaned into the conservation strategy for the California spotted owl um, in the Sierra Nevada, um, otherwise known as the California spotted owl conservation strategy that was signed in 2019. That looks at what are those habitat needs. We also looked at uh, um, what fire risk is on the landscape and what that transmission rate to communities and things we care about, uh, including power lines and um, water flumes and, and other infrastructure. Um, and by doing so, we we utilize potential operational delineations and risk to uh, things within those pods. That's, that's a way to delineate or um, to section off the, the landscape. Um, from there, it was how do we protect those things that we do care about? And so, so as you'll hear in just a few moments, uh, we're looking at different treatments at different scales at a, at a, um, at a faster pace. Um, and that uh, that that work was uh, really fine-tuned uh, to a degree with uh, another model called Forces that we'll hear a little bit about. Um, those are those models um, help guide us, but then it's through our scientific knowledge, our our specialists, our um, and by our specialists, I don't necessarily again mean just Forest Service. I mean all of us um, looking together at what that data says to come up with the best um, proposed action possible. And then in the end, we're using the same known treatments that we've used on any number of other projects over the past uh, 10 years, just at a larger scale. So we know we know what, what works and what's working. Um, we keep improving on what those treatments are, what the prescriptions are, so that we can protect everything we care about um, and more. Um, and so that is really what led us here today, was a lot of work has gone into the last couple of years um, we've we've engaged uh, um, our our research partners at Pacific Southwest Research Station, Rocky Mountain Research Station, from a number of universities um, and elsewhere to help us uh, 
come up with the best project possible. Um, my hope is that uh, um, over the next uh, few weeks as you're reviewing this, you help us refine even more so that we can make this, this project not just something we can be proud of, but something that we can implement together um, so that our communities, habitat, and other recreation and other opportunities are not just protected, but enhanced in the long term, um, which is uh, what takes me. I am going to throw out the um, Forest Service mission statement, which is uh, to sustain the health, diversity, and productivity of the nation's forests and grasslands to meet the needs of present and future generations. And I'm going to pause on one piece there, and that is the nation's forests and grasslands, specifically in the mission statement, is in lowercase, and that's because um, while I don't have any jurisdiction on state or private lands, I have some responsibility to, to work in that shared stewardship manner, to work um, to help enhance and protect those lands, be it on uh, national forest system lands or not. This decision doesn't uh, um, allow for or make decisions on any of those state and private lands, but it does uh, um, work to protect them. And yet we still need those state and private lands to uh, to work on similar uh, projects, uh, uh, fuel breaks, um, shaded fuel breaks, thinning projects, maybe even prescribed fire, so that this um, landscape works as one. Uh, the landscape, the land does not know boundaries, um, so let's work together to make this the best landscape possible. And so with that, I'm going to turn to Katie um, for for more information specific to the CERO project. Again, thank you all for joining. Thanks for all your input so far. Looking forward to more. Okay, thank you, Jason. And can you guys see my screen again? It says, what is CERO? Martin, thank you, Martin. I look to you every time. <laughs> Great. Okay, thank you. All right, so let's just start with, you know, I mean, Jason gave an overview of what CERL is, but let's get down into like the actual proposal here. So what is CERL? It's a planning effort designed to restore forest resilience, or put a different way, it's an effort designed to reduce the landscape susceptibility or vulnerability to natural disturbances, such as insect and disease infestations, drought, and as Jason just described, the, the high risk of wildfire. Got a sluggish screen for a second. There we go. And Jason just touched on this a little bit too, but I'll, I'll reiterate it. So how is CERL the same or different from our past planning efforts? You're going to see tonight that we're proposing many of the same types of vegetation management actions that we have over the past few decades. There's nothing new in terms of the mechanism in which we're going to achieve our desired conditions. What's new about CERL, however, is the scale of the actions that we're proposing and that we've been working collaboratively, collaboratively with Yosemite Stanislaus Solutions to develop the proposed action. We've worked with a team of scientists and professionals who supported this effort and developed landscape condition metrics, which we use to assess both the need for treatment and where treatments are proposed on the landscape. We use FORCES, as Jason briefly mentioned as well, which is a scenario planning tool, which enabled the team to rapidly synthesize the suite of landscape condition metrics that were developed for this effort to locate and select proposed treatment areas in the project area. And we also used potential wild land fire operational delineations or pods, as Jason mentioned, to inform implementation prioritization and strategies. <clears throat> Where is CERL? CERL is centrally located on the Stanislaus National Forest. It's fully located within the Yosemite Stanislaus Solution Collaborative Area, which is the yellow area displayed on your screen in the map. It's located south and east of the North Fork Stanislaw River and north and west of the North Fork Tuolumne River. And the project area is almost entirely to the north and west of Highway 108, which is a, a small linear red line that bisects this, this map here. This is a 118,800 acre project area which spans portions of the Calaveras, Miwok, and Summit Ranger districts of the Stanislaw National Forest. 
but about 80% or almost 95,000 acres of those 118,808 acres occur on Forest Service lands. And the suite of actions that we'll discuss today that we're proposing in the Serial Project are located primarily on Forest Service lands. So how is CERAL going to restore forest resilience and reduce the landscape susceptibility to natural disturbance? Our proposals aim to restore the landscape to better mimic historic conditions or the natural range of variation, NRV, which some of you might hear. Um, and to do that, the CERAL project needs to increase forest heterogeneity by restoring the proportion of different sizes and densities of trees across the forested area to closer within the natural range of variation, as I just mentioned. We, we need to reduce tree densities. We need to increase the relative abundance of fire tolerant and shade intolerant trees. We need to reduce and maintain low levels of surface and ladder fuels. We need to apply and reintroduce fire to the landscape at larger, more regular intervals. And we need to respond to natural disturbances which result in tree mortality rates exceeding what was naturally occurring. There's other needs that, that work collectively with the need to restore forest resilience. There's conservation needs. So what are those conservation needs? We need to retain large, old, and structurally diverse trees and snags. And we need to reduce the spread of invasive non-native weeds from existing or new infestations. There's also social needs. Those are to provide economic, not, ugh, excuse me, sorry, provide economic opportunities to local communities, such as wood products, and maintain safe access to public lands. So what are the actions that we're proposing to meet all of these needs of the CERAL project? That we're, we're proposing forest thinning, which would be conducted via timber harvest operations, biomass removal, or mastication. We're proposing fuel reduction treatments, which would be conducted via mastication or piling and burning. We are proposing a network of fuel breaks to be constructed and then maintained via timber, and that would be achieved via timber harvest, biomass removal, mastication, or hand thinning and piling and burning. We're also proposing prescribed fire. We're including the proposal to salvage dead and dying trees. Again, that would be achieved via timber harvest and biomass removal, and hazard tree abatement also achieved via timber harvest or felling. Ignore the biomass removal there. And lastly, um, we're also proposing to conduct some invasive weed control and eradication techniques. And as you can see, none of these specific on the ground actions that we're proposing are new. These are things that everybody's used to the forest doing. So what alternatives are being considered? The CERAL team worked collaboratively with YSS and other, other entities to develop and consider three iterations of the of proposed actions and a no action alternative. Alternative one was developed, as I mentioned, collaboratively with YSS, and it applies the management approaches and conservation strategies presented in the California Spotted Owl Strategy that Jason talked about. It also includes 33 individual proposed pr forest plan amendments, which adopt the management approaches and conservation strategies included in that California Spotted Owl Strategy. Those 33 plan amendments apply specifically to Alternative 1 and only within the CERAL project. So in other words, there are project and Alternative 1 specific forest plan amendments. Um, and the suite of amendments include new additions to the forest plan, as well as some that are just modifications to existing plan content and or that eliminate portions of or full plan content. Alternative two, as I mentioned, um, is the no action alternative, meaning nothing is proposed. Alternative three is most similar to the objectives of alternative one. However, the proposed actions were modified to comply with the current unamended forest plan direction. So the, those proposed project specific forest plan amendments included in alternative one are not included in alternative three. And lastly, alternative four was developed in response to the suite of perceived public concerns that were submitted during public scoping. And like alternative three, it, it was developed in compliance with the current unamended forest plan. The most notable differences of alternative four include a static 20 inch DBH limit to all forest thinning treatments with few exceptions. Uh, no mechanical treatments in California spotted owl packs, 
no salvage of insect and disease drought or wildfire fire kill trees, no hazard tree abatement, and no herbicide use or control um, to eradicate non-native invasive weeds. <clears throat> So how were the treatment areas selected to create each of those alternatives? We used modeled fire effects. We, we selected areas where modeled fire effects were most negative and where forest structure was most departed from reference conditions. And that was informed by two of the landscape condition metrics that were developed for our effort. And that those are the expected net value change and the resiliency departure metric, which we can talk about in more detail if people desire. We selected treatment areas and, and applied treatment acreage targets that were informed by an NRV-based NRV restoration assessment to determine the need on the landscape, and we did not exceed those acreage targets. We selected areas, we, we intentionally avoided selecting areas within owl nest stands or on private lands. The forest thinning proposed treatment areas were targeted into areas dominated by conifers with diameters greater than six inches and canopy covers greater than 40%. The fuel reduction proposed treatments were targeted into areas that contain smaller conifers or larger conifers, but with open canopies hardwoods or shrubs and where slopes are less than or equal to 45% and where they were located within 250 feet of a road. So the, the treatment area was limited. We also only selected areas within California spotted owl packs that were most departed from reference conditions as informed by what we refer to as the CSO departure index. Again, another metric that was developed for our, our serial effort. Alternative one, um, further targeted treatment and constrained treatment to allow treatment areas to be selected in only up to 100 acres per California spotted owl pack. Alternative three alternatively did not allow treatment selection in California spotted owl packs located outside of WUI defense and threat zones. And alternative four did not allow treatment areas to be selected within any area of a California spotted owl pack. So everything I just said and how we got to what our, how we located where the treatments were on the landscape produced the alternatives considered in detail in the draft EIS. The table you see on your screen here summarizes each of the proposed activities, how that activity will be achieved or the mechanism that, that, it, that will be used to achieve, <clears throat> where each type of activity is located, how each activity is connected to the restoration needs of the project, and then the estimated acres for each activity among, among the alternatives. So I know a lot's here, but we'll just quickly walk through them because I think it'll help explain what we're doing and answer some questions that have been informally fed to me. Um, so first row, forest thinning. Forest thinning is achieved via timber harvest operations, biomass removal or mastication, as I mentioned previously. These treatments are Located in dense conifer stands where average, average diameters of trees are greater than six inches and canopy covers are greater than 40%. And forest thinning is used to increase heterogeneity by restoring the proportion of different sizes and densities across the forested areas. It will help us reduce stand densities and it'll increase the relative abundance of fire tolerant and shade intolerant trees. And while meeting all of those ecological needs and goals, it will also provide wood product. Alternative one would conduct forest thinning over the most acres in comparison to alternative three and four. And I don't have alternative two displayed here because I'll remind you that's the no action alternative. So that's essentially zero. The additional acreage of forest thinning in alternative one is due in most part to proposing more treatments in California spotted owl packs than is possible under the current forest plan direction. Similarly, alternative three only allows treatments to occur within California spotted owl packs located within the weed defense or threat zones. And alternative four proposes the least acres of forest thinning of all the alternatives, largely because we do not propose treatment in California spotted owl packs at all. And for those interested, there are 53 currently mapped spotted owl packs in the project area, which equate to um, a, a almost 16,000 acres. So this is a large proportion of our project area. 
Moving on to fuel reduction treatments, the second row. Those are achieved primarily via mastication or piling and burning. Fuel reduction treatments are located in areas with small conifers with average diameters less than six inches, conifers with diameters greater than six inches, but with, with lower canopy covers less than 40%, in areas where oak shrubs or other herbaceous vegetation occur, on slopes less than 35%, or within woolly defense zones, or within 200, sorry, it's and within woolly defense zones or within 250 feet of a level two, three, four, or five road. Fuel reduction treatments reduce and maintain low levels of surface and ladder fuels. And as you can see, the, the proposal varies very little for fuel reduction treatments uh, among the alternatives. It's pretty, pretty similar. Moving on to fuel brake construction and maintenance, we achieve the construction and maintenance of fuel brakes using the full suite of treatment mechanisms, depending on the location of the fuel brake. So a fuel brake might be be, might be constructed using timber harvest, biomass removal, mastication, hand thinning, or piling and burning. The network of proposed fuel breaks were delineated by our local fire and fuel staff, and the fuel breaks were located and chosen to help support the goal of returning fire to the landscape at a large scale and at regular intervals. The same fuel break network is proposed for each alternative, that, which is reflected in the table there. So the next, the the next row says follow up prescribed fire. And what we mean by that is that wherever forest thinning, fuel reduction, or fuel break work has occurred, follow up prescribed fire would occur where necessary. So this will help to reduce and maintain low levels of surface and ladder fuels, and it'll also further support the large scale prescribed fire being regularly applied to the landscape. Those acres are not mutually exclusive, so they, they essentially equal the, the preceding three rows. The, the last column or the last row that says prescribed fire, this is prescribed fire that would occur in areas where no other treatment has been proposed and therefore fire is the primary treatment. Presently, these particular prescribed fire acres are limited. You see that the acreages are low because it's not safe or operationally feasible to burn much of the project area without preparation, mainly the other proposed vegetation treatments that we're proposing. In order to treat the acres we ultimately desire with prescribed fire, we want, we want to get fire on the landscape across the whole project area. The other primary treatments that I've just discussed are needed in order to prepare the landscape to receive such a scale of broadcast burning. But collectively, Cyril is designed to achieve that goal. So, okay. So here's a similar table, but what I'm showing here is a second suite of proposed treatments that we also consider. These additional proposed treatments were designed to respond in a limited manner, intentionally limited manner, to future natural disturbances which result in tree mortality rates exceeding the natural range of variation, or to maintain safe access to public lands. This table again summarizes each of the proposed activities, how that activity will be achieved, or the mechanism that will be used, where each type of activity is located and when that activity would be authorized to occur or the trigger for it. So we'll walk through this table similar to the last. The first row, we propose the salvage of insect disease or drought killed trees. And this would occur via timber harvest operations where and when the, condi the following conditions are met. For example, we have intentionally limited the area of potential insect disease and drought killed tree salvage to areas within 0.25 miles of level two, three, four, and five national forest system roads in mixed conifer fir, mixed conifer pine, or pine dominated areas with large conifers greater than six inches in diameter and located outside of packs and outside of proposed wild and scenic river corridors. This type of salvage can be considered where and when where within this area of potential salvage, patches containing more than 75% of beetle diseased or drought killed trees exceed 10 acres in size, or when multiple, oops, sorry, I'm going back, or when multiple patches combined exceed 15% of a Huck 6 watershed. It can also occur, only occur when a cumulative watershed effect analysis determines that a threshold of concern would not be exceeded.
So the area of potential salvage where you can consider the salvage of insect disease and drought killed trees as defined there in the where equals 37,243 acres. But that does not mean we're going to salvage 37,243 acres. All of those other conditions must be met and including some additional not itemized here. Um, but what I do want to point out is that much of those 37,243 acres overlap with the other proposed treatments that we discussed on the previous slide. Only 2,416 acres of that potential salvage area are unique areas that don't contain any other proposed treatment. The next, so, and, and uh, the last thing I want to point out about that row a salvage of insect disease and drought killed trees is that both alternative one and alternative three consider and propose that treatment, but alternative four does not propose the salvage insect disease or drought killed trees or wildfire killed trees or hazard tree as you see here. Okay, so moving on to salvage of wildfire killed trees. That would also occur via timber harvest operations where and when specific conditions are met. The salvage of wildfire killed trees is only allowed to occur in up to 500 acres per Huck 6 watershed with a maximum of 300 acres in the project area and only within seven years of the of the ultimately designed decision. Although we set an acreage cap, other triggers must also be met before the salvage of wild, wildfire killed trees would be authorized. A wildfire must produce or cause areas burned at high severity with greater than 75% mortality in excess of 10% of a Huck 6 watershed before you could consider the wildfire salvage to occur. And similar to the last row, the threshold of concern must not be exceeded once the cumulative watershed effect analysis is conducted. Where and when wildfire, as you know, may occur is unknown. So the extent to which wildfire salvage may overlap acres of other proposed treatment areas is, is, un, is currently unknown. The last row on this table is hazard tree removal. And again, it'll be achieved via timber harvest operations or felling to abate the hazard. And CERL proposes to authorize hazard tree removal along 285 miles of national forest system roads traversing public lands in the project area when any tree identified as a hazard following current standards and and direction occurs. The area where potential hazard tree could be removed almost entirely overlaps with the area where salvage of insect disease and drought killed trees may be considered. Just to get a visual of where that would be. <clears throat> so how effective are our alternatives um, at meeting the purpose and needs of the CERL project? How well did those treatment areas th do? We conducted post treatment modeled assessments of how well those each alternative did and alternative one clearly and best met the purpose in each purpose and need of the CERL project. For example, post treatment proportions of CERL stages across the landscape were most measurably moved toward natural and historic ranges. Alternative one most was most effective at reducing both the total acreage and the proportion of conifer forest and the high risk density related mortality category, reducing it from 61% to 26%. Alternative one best reduces the predicted acres expected to experience high severity fire effects and increases the areas predicted to experience low severity fire effects. Alternative one best reduces the acres expected to experience crown fires and increases the area expected to experience surface fires. And it achieves the highest acres of less than four feet predicted flame lengths and the lowest proportion of greater than eight feet flame lengths. Less than four foot flame lengths are our desired condition. It provides the most wood product volume and highest delivered market value. It enables the most prescribed fire in the shortest amount of time. It maintains and promotes high quality habitat in California spotted owl packs. It allows a limited rapid response to tree mortality and hazard trees would be removed to maintain safe access to public lands. Alternatively, alternative four was the least effective at meeting the purpose and needs of the project. And we believe that we anticipate that the effectiveness is further diminished by a few other factors associated with the proposed actions, which I'd like to share with you now. So for example, we expect that the 20 inch static DBH limit, no treatments in California spotted owl packs and no salvage or hazard tree removal 
will collectively impact the feasibility of implementation and the wood product that would be available if alternative four was selected. The proposed treatments in alternative four are more costly. They'll require more resources, which could likely delay implementation and extend the timeline to complete the, the suite of actions. And most importantly, applying prescribed fire at the scale that is needed and proposed is dependent on the other proposed proposed forest thinning, fuel reduction, and fuel break treatments being implemented and completed prior to applying fire. So these other treatments provide the critical landscape preparation to ensure prescribed fire is operationally feasible and applied safely. So jumping rate right to next steps, that completes the overview of the project and the draft EIS, but our next steps will be to review and respond to comments received during this comment period prior to um, January 24th, the end of the day. In that review, we'll identify and update the draft EIS in preparation for the final EIS. We'll make clarification edits and modifications. Um, we'll document how comments were addressed. That will be included in the in available for review in the final EIS. We'll, we'll develop the draft rod once that's complete, once both the FEIS and the draft rod are ready, we'll publish the FEIS notice of availability and initiate an objection period, which would last 45 days. At the close of the 45 day objection period, the regional office objection review team will review those objections, hold a resolution meeting with any potential objectors, and then potentially provide instructions or suggestions to the forest, which we would have to be which we would be required to incorporate in the final EIS prior to finalizing the ROD and prior to signing the final decision. Once we sign the final decision, we'll begin implementation. So those are the big next steps. But we gathered here today because we would like your feedback. And so how do you submit a comment? You have until 9 p.m. Pacific time on January 24th to submit specific written comments and you can do so by visiting the project website. Um, there's a link on the side that says comment on project or object, and you can click that link and it provides you an opportunity to directly electronically submit comments. Alternatively, you can mail comments to the, the supervisor's office here. If at any time anyone has any technical difficulty submitting a comment, please by all means reach out and we're happy to help you do that. With that, that's Let's get to the fun part of questions and answers. <laughs> Thanks for listening. And thank you everybody for the questions you've put in the chat already. Um, my name is Curtis Kwame. I'm a soil scientist on the Stanislaw National Forest and I'll be moderating the Q&A here. Um, before I get to some of the more detailed questions, I'll just put in, I'll say verbally a couple of clarifying things that happened in the chat. I know not everybody can see that chat as it's coming around. So um, let me scroll up. I think the first one was uh, Peter Stein mentioned and defined what nest stands were. Um, Katie talked about nest stands in re reference to PACs, uh, protected activity centers. So a nest stand is the 10 acres around the known nest site of a California spotted owl. Um, so those areas have particular protections. Um, even more so than the pack itself. Um, and if there's more info, we can get to that again. I just thought I'd read it out. Um, one other quick clarification was, um, Katie mentioned the Huck 6 watersheds. Um, those, it, it, in particular, she was talking about those in the salvage sections. So a Huck 6 is a hydrologic unit code, and it's just the, the, the jargon that we use to describe a large watershed. Uh, they range from 10, about 10,000 to 40,000 acres. So that's what a Huck 6 watershed is. Um, I thought there was one more definition, but that's all I have at the moment. Um, so the first thing, um, Jacob, if you're ready, I was wondering if I could ask you to talk about what NRV stands for natural range variation and as you're coming on i'll read that question aloud um, i think it was from 
Uh, John Buckley asked, well, it's clear to the Forest Service staff what NRV means. It may be helpful to at least take two or three minutes to provide the basics of what NRV is and how, how far out of that natural historic condition much of the serial landscape is. Um, and sorry, sorry to cut you off, Jake, uh, before you answer. Uh, folks, please continue to put questions in the chat. Um, if you would like to do that. Otherwise, um, you can start raising your hands and we'll get to you uh, one at a time, but it might take a while. So keep your hands up until we call on you, but I promise we'll get there. Thanks. Go ahead, Jake. Hi, everybody. My name is Jacob Baker. I'm a forester on the Stanislaw National Forest, um, and I can talk a little bit about the natural range variation and why we talk about it or why we mention it so much. Um, so NRV, uh, as it's abbreviated, is basically the range of forest conditions we would expect to find across the landscape um, in terms of forest structure, composition function, um, if these forests were maintained by an intact disturbance regime, in this case, like frequent low to moderate severity fire, um, with the idea being that forests that are within their natural range of variation would be expected to be more resilient to large scale disturbances like high intensity wildfire, um, large scale bark beetle outbreaks or drought related mortality. Um, so we used, we're using NRV in this project as like a, a basis for our desired condition across the landscape. Um, some of the major changes, I guess, because there has been such major disruption of the fire regime throughout the Sierra Nevada and within this project area is that we have way more trees per unit area, like our stands are much denser. Uh, those trees tend to be smaller. Um, we have way fewer big trees and there's been a number of other changes. There's, so there's a lot of different ways to um, quantify NRV. Um, and there, there's a few of them that we, we discuss in, in the draft EIS. Um, and I guess if I could just say one more thing that what something that we are not using NRV as it's not um, we're not trying to mimic a snapshot from the 1850s as our desired condition. It's, it's not that literal. It's, it's a guide or a waypoint um, that we're using to, to help direct our proposed actions and in, in what we want this landscape to look like. Um, and one of the reasons that we do focus on it so much also is because of the, the California Spotted Owl Strategy um, re really focuses on NRV and the importance of reestablishing or moving towards um, the natural range of variation again. Um, so that's why it plays such a prominent role in, in our draft EIS also. Great. Thanks, Jacob. Um, before I go on to the next question, if anyone has a follow up to the NRV, we can go ahead and tackle that now rather than going back and forth. So if anyone has another follow up on NRV, raise your hand or put a quick chat in. I'll pause just for a second. All right, if um, we can still come back to that, so we're not going to close that door, but I'll move on for now. Uh, there was one question um, from Tom. He asked, uh, will the isolated Forest Service parcels between Twain Hart and Columbia be part of this project? And uh, uh, Brian McCrory did answer that in the chat, but I'll read it um, for the the good of the recording and everything. So um, yes, uh, uh, excuse me, sorry, the isolated parcels and those are like 40 to 80 acre chunks that are sort of outside the main Forest Service boundary between Columbia and Twain Hart. Those are not directly covered in the Cerro project, but they were covered under the Cedar Ridge Fuels Reduction Project. And they are actually currently under a contract for treatment uh, within the next year, um, according to Brian McCrory. So I believe those are under um, a, a contract in affiliation with the county through the master stewardship agreement. Um, Jason or Brian, if you want to add more on that, feel free to, but um, just worth mentioning that. So thank you, Tom, for that question. Um, next was hydrologic unit code. So uh, another reading question from the chat. Um, Lisa asked, uh, what is the proposed treatment for the majority of the watershed areas in the Cerro landscape? And um, Tracy answered the 
treatments are what Katie described in her presentation. The amount of each treatment in the watershed varies, but the threshold of concern or TOC, an abbreviation we use, was not exceeded under any of the action alternatives. Um, so a little more there, there are <clears throat> um, tables in the draft EIS that line out the amount of acres that are being treated in the uh, whole project area, but you could, you'd have to look at the map, um, other maps that we have in the documentation to see relatively what is in each of those hydrologic unit code watersheds. Um, we make the GIS data available for those that are interested, but I know that's a little above and beyond what most folks are interested. So, um, <clears throat> so next, uh, is it okay to put Lucas on the spot? Um, if you're on camera, give me a thumbs up there. Um, but John Buckley asked, um, Lucas may want to explain what LIDAR is, and that stands for Light Detection and Ranging and um, how it is used to model treatment heats for various areas and how it was used to model the effects of different forest treatments. So Lucas, are you good to talk sure. about LIDAR a little bit? Thank you. Sure, hi, I'm Lucas Wilkinson. I'm the GIS coordinator for the Stanislaus. As Curtis said, LIDAR uh, stands for light detection and ranging. And in simple terms, it's an airplane flies over the whole landscape with a laser that can measure the distance to the ground and to trees and to all objects that it that it hits and it measures all of those distances as it flies across in like a grid pattern. So basically we get a detailed map of the contours of the surface and then we can also map where each individual tree is and the height of each individual tree. Um, and we recently got an acquisition um, and across all of Tuolumne County and and the entire Stanislaus so with the help of or through Tuolumne County. Um, and the main the main way that was used in this serial project um, is in the development of two of the two of the metrics that we used for the modeling. Um, the main one being the resilience departure index. So that was created. Um, from folks at the University of Washington. And what they've done is identified uh, reference sites in the Sierra Nevada that have a, a more natural fire regime, a restored fire regime, so that they've experienced lower moderate severity fires um, on more of an expected fire return interval. And so those are considered sites that, that represent the conditions that we're trying to achieve. And so, they take those sites and they have LIDAR for those sites and they um, determine um, what is the average number of trees per acre, the average clump size, the average gap size. And so they, they develop these metrics representing the forest structure in those reference conditions. And then they do the same thing based on the, on the LIDAR data for our landscape. And so they can look at, you know, how many gaps are there, how many groups of large trees are there and by comparing the um, the reference stands to um, the serial stands um, and looking at the difference between those you can you can develop an index that shows you where your current conditions are most departed from those good reference conditions and so that was the resilience departure index um, and so basically, you know, basically it's showing us where there are too many trees on our landscape and not enough gaps. And so we use that to prioritize um, selection of treatments in the in the forces um, process. And the other place that the LIDAR data was was used was in the development of that um, the California spotted owl departure index. And so that was used to identify places where there were large trees and clumps of large trees that 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 represented the the best habitat um for the for the owl that answer that great thanks lucas um katie if you want to come back on screen there was a question about forest plan amendment i saw you were going to type about that but do you mind chatting about it sure or would obviously. you rather type it out <laughs> It's OK, I, I just I can just basically read what I was writing. It might be easier this way. So Carrie, me, thanks for the question. Oh, go ahead. Let me read the question first. Um, okay. Maybe you were about to, sorry. 
Um, so Carrie asked, what is the typical length of time to approve a forest plan amendment? And just for reference, in alternative one, um, we have forest plan amendments proposed. So Katie, take it away, thanks. So Carrie, there's no typical length of time it takes to approve a forest plan amendment or amendments. Uh, forest plan amendments require the same public review opportunities as other proposed actions or projects. The length to approve an amendment is largely dependent on the project in which they're associated with. Um, so they do not themselves extend the planning or time to decision. And maybe if you have a follow up question. Or and if I didn't hit that, feel free to take take the opportunity to do so. I might I should probably also add so there's not I can't give you like an estimate of how long it takes for Cyril, um, I don't anticipate the forest plan amendments themselves causing a delay in or you know contributing to any lengthier process than the project as a whole. Great. Thanks Katie for the follow up there. Um, so next I see a question from Terrence. Um, Jacob, I don't know if you saw this one yet. I'll read it and see if it's something I can put you on the spot. Otherwise, we can open it up for some other folks. Um, Terrence asked, is there an estimate of the approximate amount of the practically available biomass in GT and BDT? Um, and I may even have to ask, because uh, it's late in the evening, my brain is turned off, <laughs> what you mean by GT and BDT? Um, that would be green tons and bone dry tons, I would assume. Thank you much. Um, uh, this is Jacob again. I'm uh, Terrence. I'm sorry. I do not know off the top of my head. So that may be something that we can uh, get back to you on, Terrence. Um, Brian, jump in if you do know anything. Otherwise, we will. Make a note of that and uh, <clears throat> try to provide that maybe at the next public meeting or if. Um, uh, I'll put my email in chat if you're willing to email um, any of us on the team, um, including myself, uh, we can get you an answer to that maybe uh, within a week or so. Thanks. Um, let me I'll type my email in chat and then look for the next question. Yeah, I'll just say, Curtis, this is Brian McCrory, um, timber manager on the on the forest that uh, on page 71 of the uh, draft EIS, there is a uh, CCF estimate of biomass um, in alternative one um, for total volume in CCF. So if you do have your own conversions for bone dry tons um, that you could you could reference that that CCF number. Great, thanks, Brian. What page was that on again? Page 71. Thank you. So Terrence also asked, uh, can you provide a little more information? Excuse me. Can you provide a little more information context on the Cedar Ridge fuels reduction project? So in the chat, I posted a link for any of those that are on the meeting now. Um, otherwise, you could go to our Stanislaw, uh, just Google Stanislaw National Forest, and on the left, there's a, uh, a planning section, and next, I believe, is um, um, forest management or projects, something to that effect, and under there, you can find um, uh, the Cedar Ridge um, categorical exclusion that was in decision memo that were signed, I believe, in 2018 or somewhere around there. So it covered um, mostly areas around to the north of Cedar Ridge, but also covered those isolated parcels between Columbia and Twain Hart. Um, so those, let me pull that up. One second, we covered different fuel reduction treatments in those isolated parcels, including Sorry, folks, bear with me. So um, mechanical treatment, biomass removal, mastication, hand thinning, it's and pile and burning. So um, more information about the actual contract could be um, made available in another format, but for now, I think we'll we'll leave it there. You can ac access that website um, 
uh, from our Forest Service homepage. So, and I haven't pre-read this question, but Megan asked, uh, can someone discuss briefly why steeper slopes greater than 35% were not proposed under the fuel reduction treatment type, <clears throat> realizing that would mean um, the need to utilize hand treatments? So I'll take the first stab at that, Megan. Um, our current forest plan has a standard in there that says um, for soil protection purposes, um, mechanical equipment needs to have special mitigations on slopes greater than 35%. So um, above 35% slopes, the um, ground-based equipment tends to have larger, um, can have a bigger environmental impact and cause more displacement and the traction is just a lot um, more reduced when you get above 35%. But um, for those slopes above 35%, we have alternative methods proposed. We um, are allowing um, aerial harvesting, and that can be uh, skyline or possibly cable assist logging. Um, that's certainly not been done much on this forest, but skyline has. So we do have um, means to treat those slopes above 35%, but um, it is for those um, erosion and stability reasons that we typically try to limit it to that 35% slope break. Um, if anyone wants to tag team that, feel free, but for now, I will move on to the next question. Uh, so Carrie asked a good one, um, Katie, uh, maybe I'll tag you for this. Uh, apology if I missed this, but what is the expected or proposed duration of the CERO project? or uh, an estimate of the number of years it will be active. Katie, would you mind um, taking that one? Actually, I'll, I'll take that one, Curtis. Um, so in terms of uh, uh, the length or estimate and time that it'll take to achieve the project, you know, our, our baseline is that we're working off of is uh, to complete mechanical treatments within seven years. That's initial treatments. We are we are looking for fuel breaks um, to do maintenance over over time with this decision. So um, we would do the initial fuel break in that seven years and might continue to maintain it uh, in years eight and beyond. So that's that's one key point. But then prescribed fire, um, we're we're wanting to implement all the prescribed fire necessary for those initial treatments within ten years. Now that does depend on some windows of opportunity. Um, but we're we're trying to have this project be based on um, allowing fire back in the landscape. These are fire dependent ecosystems, and so trying to create those treatments so that we can apply um, prescribed fire uh, at more times during the year in a safe and effective manner. So that's um, that's one one key key point there. But uh, seven to ten years for all the main treatments with some maintenance after that is the, the main answer. And one more question from Carrie. Maybe this is another one for you, Jason, if you're willing. Um, how will the project be funded and how will each of the proposed activities be prioritized? Um, that second part of that question might open up to the rest of the group there. Mm -hmm. No, great questions. Um, so how will the project be funded is a variety of different sources. Uh, we we have received uh, California Climate Investment Funds for some of the um, initial work, including that LIDAR acquisition and, and some surveys and so forth, um, as well as some other grants outside of the, the Forest Service. Um, and really thankful for Cal Fire's uh, engagement on, um, on uh, uh, on these projects, as well as Sierra Nevada Conservancy and um, and other organizations, uh, also um, receiving some appropriated funds from Congress. Um, so that's that's another source, um, including uh, uh, special bills in the past, and and then we're hopeful from the uh, the infrastructure bill recently passed that we're successful. We're pretty well suited, um, and we're we're raising our hand for some of those funds. In addition, um, there is going to be timber receipts that help to pay for stewardship items. So 
Um, when we when we have a timber sale that has some economic value, we apply some of that value to um, doing uh, additional fuels work, to improving roads, and so so forth. So those are the three main ways: external grants, appropriated funds from Congress, as well as timber timber value. Um, and then what? Uh, um, how are those treatments being prioritized? Um, so we we did a, a prioritization process using those potential operational delineations or pods, um, and and that created kind of a first step or a first glance at what those priorities are. And those pod, there's 17 total pods, and they're prioritized one through 17. Um, there are some conversations yet to be had based on. Um, how that, that model went and then where some of those funds are. So Cedar Ridge is in priority 13 and, and that is a huge priority. So in all likelihood that would be um, stepped up in a priority order based on conversation. And then we would be looking at what those treatments are and how they relate to things we care about and, and would be discussing um, internally and externally about what those, what those next areas are. Um, but uh, we will continue to use uh, science and modeling, as well as a conversation with interested parties to see where we go and how we go there. Um, and that's and then and that's that's not just within the Cerro area. Um, we're always looking for those next places that we go on the landscape. And and, and even though we're really excited about this, trying to see um, how we continue doing work on the landscape. think that was all. For the second part of that question, um, Katie, um, did you have a map of those pods you wanted to share real quick? If you don't have it available, I think I might. Um, I apologize. I thought my screen was sharing. I had it up all, the whole time Jason was talking. I'll share it right now. Can you, you rehash it. real quick? Yeah, now now your screen is shared. Can you rehash which of those pods are priorities, um, meaning where the treatments are most likely to start happening first? What Jason was just talking about the the numbers the numbers that displayed in these pods is the order of priority. So he was talking about pods one through five. He mentioned pod 13, which is where the Cedar Ridge project area is. And so this is just the visual. The numbers are the priority order to implement the treatments that are proposed within those pods. Great, thanks for showing that. I think it helps um, we've got the map um, on the page at the same time, so thank you. Mm -hmm. um, next question I have, actually I'm gonna pause first and ask, uh, since I forgot to think of it earlier, for anybody that is just on the phone and may not have access to the chat um, or a computer right now, uh, if you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself now or in one of these periods between questions and just say your name and that you have a question. Um, I forgot to mention that we do have people that are just on the phone, not on the computer. so. I'll give one window now. Speak up if you have one. Not hearing any. Um, John, Hold on, I see Curtis, your hand is. Oh. Yeah, John Quidditche. Yeah, I do see. I do see John's hand up. Um, I will get to you right after this next question, John. I think um, you'll be coming up quickly. Thanks. So the next question I had, I scrolled away from it. Sorry, bear with me. A question from Rose. Um, um, I believe, Michael, you might be willing to take a first stab at this. The question was, among the four alternatives, can you share what challenges you foresee uh, will impact public access to public land within the Cyril project boundaries? Uh, Michael, are you willing to take the first cut at that? Yeah, I'll take a first kind of it. Hi, I'm, I'm Michael Joe. I'm the resource management staff officer for the forest. And Rose, uh, you might have to clarify your question a little bit more, but um, with the activities that we're that we're planning, um, it should be typical of 
of what those closures and restrictions are um, during our normal forest uh, veg management uh, activities. So that means there might be some short term closures while they're reconstructing roads or when they're operating in a certain area. Um, but in general, we, we do a good job of, of maintaining access. Um, so it would be um, we, we'd have to reconstruct some roads to get the product removal or to improve access. And then when they're logging in certain areas or hazard trees, we'll close that down for public safety. Um, but in, in general, um, and then with prescribed fire, of course, and at the scale that we're hoping to um, implement it, uh, once we once we get some of these mechanical treatments done, there will be short term closures while activities are going on for for public safety. But but in general, most of them will be uh, localized to the area where we're working at in short term. Um, so if you had a, additional clarification, Rose, maybe you could um, go off mute and, and ask that. That answered my question. Thank you. So, John uh, Quidditch, I, I, your hand has been up for a few minutes. Um, if you would like to unmute yourself and ask your question, now is uh, your turn. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, John Quidditch, I am representing the Associated California Loggers. And I have two questions. One is, um, you know, I was listening over my, my wife's shoulder, Karen. <laughs> And uh, she, uh, I heard, uh, I apologize for not listening on, on all the alternatives, but I heard there was a mention of, you know, watershed and thresholds of concern, CWEs. I want to know how would, would that preclude any treatments in areas? And I, I'm well aware of how this, the modeling is done. And why would it preclude any treatment? The second question is, in your spotted owl areas, um, you have some proposals to do treatments on, this, on one and maybe one and the number two alternative. What diameter limits would be limiting? You know, is it small trees under 10 inches? Uh, will there be a, an allowance to harvest trees up to 30 inches, for example. You know, so get, uh, could you please address that? And I think that's really a big concern uh, out here in industry land, uh, where you know there's a there's a need to have sustainability for wood products, you know, to feed you know the mill industry. So if somebody could address that, that would be great. Thanks, John for the questions. Um, Tracy uh, Weddle, um, if you're willing to cover that first one, and we may come back to uh, his second question again. Yeah, hi, I'm Tracy Weddle. I'm the forest hydrologist, and so I did the, the CWE analysis. And um, all the proposed actions, um, the timber harvest, all of those activities were all under the threshold of concern for all of the action alternatives. And that included an analysis of the um, potential hazard tree treatments along roads if there were insect disease, um, salvage needs, not salvage, hazard tree removal needs. That was all within um, the threshold of concern, all under it. Um, we would update for fire salvage or for insect disease uh, drought salvage, we would update that analysis to make sure we're not exceeding the threshold of concern for the for the additional salvage. Um, but things can be done to mitigate, for example, um, you know, timing of treatments. Um, there, there are ways to try and stay under that threshold of concern and still be doing doing treatments. Um, so the limitations, I think, will be will be pretty minimal and and only the only potential is for salvage. Did that answer that? Just to follow up to that question, question John. That, uh, okay. comment you made, 
And so you're talking about just just in the road zones where that would be applied, where these thresholds are the concerns. What what about outside those areas? What about outside those road zones? The the all of our treatments that that are proposed that we have units for those are all within the threshold, and we and any hazard tree we would we would proceed on. So the only thing that could have limitations is salvage. So that's what needs to we need to make sure stays under the threshold of concern. And so why why would you worry about that threshold of concern? Is it is it, is it would preclude what? Um, the threshold of concern is a modeling um, exercise. Is that model always accurate? Um, no, it is not perfect like any model. Um, the purpose of it is to 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 paint a picture and look at things more more closely when you're approaching that threshold and then work with with the water board or others. If if there's a huge um, wildfire, the, the Cerro Nipa only covers 500 acres of wildfire salvage in each watershed. So it's unlikely with that amount of salvage. Um, you know, we have a limited amount. Our thought was that there would be bigger impacts for lots of other resources, and we would need to do another analysis if there was something that was huge, you know, on the scale of um, another rim fire. We would want to look at that individually and then decide what we wanted to do. So Cyril is meant more as trying to prevent the wildfire treating the land and dealing to a certain extent with other um, impacts. Um, but anything really large, we would do another analysis to to deal with it. And I, I think I will say one more thing and then move on just to keep the conversation moving. Um, but Tracy's last point there, John, is is the main one. So because these fires haven't happened yet, it's pretty it's pretty ambitious for Cerro to uh, authorize those treatments before a big disturbance event happens. So that's um, we intended to limit it so it was uh, a little less controversial, but know that it is not normal for the Forest Service to approve those before these treatments happen. That said, it doesn't stop us from doing another analysis. So we could do an analysis just like we did after the rim fire for large scale salvage. It's just not included in CERL. Um, so I'd like to move on to the, your second question there and then get to some other folks, at least one more question before seven. I know we're running short on time. Um, was anyone able, um, was it Jacob maybe to come in and take a stab at the uh, diameter limits? His second question. Um, and if we need to go back and have him repeat, we can. Yeah, I've, if I remember right, um, like it was a while ago, but I think it was the question about diameter limits in spotted owl packs. Um, if that's the case, uh, there is a 20 inch diameter limit within the packs. Um, I, I mean, we do recognize that this is limiting, but we're trying to strike a balance by maintain that in that critical spotted owl habitat in the landscape and trying to improve the resilience of this landscape but we are proposing treatments in up to 100 acres of packs which is a major step forward for us um, and we are proposing many thousands of acres of thinning outside of those packs to uh, going up to 30 and even 34 inches in some special cases let me know if that doesn't answer your question yeah, thank you for that. I, I just want to make a comment that, you know, on the Caldor fire, um, I don't know how many packs were lost, but take note that there was a lot. Um, and that's, you know, directly due to no treatments and the spot allowed out of particular areas. Um, take a really hard look at that. Uh, and I know that, you know, you have your, your forest plan that you have to comply with, but I think um, the Caldor fire, there's many examples. Drive up Iron Mountain Road, MET, you'll see firsthand what happens when you do not treat in spotted lateral areas. You lose the packs. So that which you are trying to protect, you're destroying. That's, that's it. That's my comment. Thank you.
thanks for that. And um, yeah, feel free to, I'm sure you will submit comments um, during the comment period here for the DIS. That's something that we will we will consider. Um, I'll, I'm gonna go to Pat Haley next. Uh, now you've had your hand up, but before um, you unmute there, Pat, I just wanna say we are running up pretty close to seven o'clock. So Pat, you may be the last one of the evening. Um, Katie says, and we'll, after Pat is done, um, we will have a, a second Q&A session um, next week. So we will send out additional info there. Um, if folks are not able to attend that Q&A session, please, we'll keep this chat open. So feel free to type your questions here, and then we can do uh, maybe a written, um, written responses to your questions and make those available. Um, for now, though, I think we'll start with Pat, um, hear your question and see what time it is after. So go ahead. Thanks. Hello. First of all, thank you for all you do. Um, we're out in the Twain Heart area, South Fork of the Italian, uh, South Fork of the Stanislaus near the Italian Bar Bridge. Um, property owners here. And, you know, as we talk about the health of this forest, you, I think, primarily indicate the the drought and the pine bark beetle, obviously. But do any of you know about, or can you talk about the geoengineering, uh, solar radiation management, the manufactured weather that's sprayed over our mountains almost every day? Um, it, it may be out of your purview, I'm not sure, but I would sure like to uh, to know if, if any of that is taken into account when we talk about the health of these forests. The aluminum, the barium, the strontium, all the metals raining down in the air column, changing the pH of the forest, making the forest and the trees extremely more volatile. Um, it just seems to me that, uh, that there can't be any any legitimate discussion of the health of these forests without first addressing the manufactured weather that's going on over our heads almost every day. Uh, again, that may be out of your purview. Maybe you do know about it. Maybe you don't. Maybe you can talk about it. Maybe you cannot. But if you look up, it's pretty plain to see. Geoengineering is, is it's here almost every day. So your comments, please. Jason, uh, I wonder if you'd be willing to mention things there. Otherwise, I have a couple things I could say about watershed condition and how the monitoring data I know we do have. Um, so we, I would say that's generally outside the scope. Um, that's not an activity we we participate in. Um, but uh, appreciate that that comment. And and so then, uh, uh, Curtis, I'll turn it back to you for um, general watershed condition. But uh, thank you for that comment. And and this is it, this is not an intentional dodge, Pat. Just um, but I think I'll just say that we don't probably have good information on on some of that, but there are things that we have monitoring data for like ozone and um, pH changes in water bodies. Those have been monitored over time. I don't, I'm not an expert in that data, so I won't try to comment on it, but we know that there have been changes in high elevation lake pH and ozone levels over time. So those things do affect, um, ozone does affect vegetation, um, but the other information I think we don't have expertise to speak to. Um, so that if you have a follow up, um, feel free. Otherwise, I will maybe look to another question. Um, and I've lost. I don't. I completely understand. Well, I, again, I completely understand. Um, I, I just hope you're aware of it. I wanted to kind of get it out there for comment and maybe hope some others will get interested and look into the geoengineering. I don't know that there's a way to stop it, but it certainly is affecting our forests and our firefighters and the health of our forests and all of us. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the comment. Um, and this has gone back a little bit. It looks like we might have time for one more. Um, uh, Jason, this was about the ESD, um, just jockey memory. John Buckley asked, uh, because the YSS stakeholder group is so concerned about protecting forest communities, from high severity wildfires, the group has supported the possible consideration of an ESD. That's emergency. Well, I'm going to let Jason <laughs> do that because it's I've forgotten at the moment. Uh, can Jason explain what an ESD is and why he may propose an approval of one for Sarah? 
No, thanks for that that question, John, and, and prompts. So an emergency situation determination historically has been used uh, post um, natural disturbance, um, generally around fires, sometimes uh, hurricanes or other um, tornadoes in the east and, and um, other natural disasters. In this case, what we're looking for with an emergency situation determination is that, that fire um, prevalence on the landscape and how how we are essentially running out of time to change that trajectory. And so every acre counts in order to um, reduce risk of wildland fire um, spreading to things that we care about. And so based on lots of conversation with uh, uh, Yosemite Stanislaus Solutions, as well as uh, internally and with other external partners, um, we're, we're seeking um, input from the public on whether or not this project should um, utilize an emergency situation determination for a component of the project. And it's um, what that component is are the fuel breaks within uh, the potential operational delineations or pods one through five. So those five top priorities that generally are, are right along that north side of Highway 108, right in and around uh, communities of Twain Hart and Sugar Pine and Miwok and uh, Cold Springs and going up to, towards Strawberry and Pinecrest. All of that is to, um, uh, to try to get as many acres accomplished as soon as we can um, to, to put in those fuel breaks, to have them um, in a state that if we would have a fire, um, maybe this summer, hopefully not, that we could uh, best protect um, those communities. So that's the intent there. Um, it's uh, It would be a, a newer thing that we can um, or would be utilizing nationally but the intent is, is that these fires are continuing to grow. Our um, communities and habitat are being impacted and we're looking for ways to reduce those impacts. Um, and, and again, looking for feedback on that, uh, on that request. Um, that's not something I can unilaterally make a decision on. That has to go to the Chief of the Forest Service in Washington, D.C., who's Randy Moore. Um, who formerly was our regional forester. So we're continuing to have conversations with the regional office and Washington office on that as well. Um, and so there's a number of other questions in here that uh, did not answer. I'm going to touch on one real quick on give us an image on what success looks like. And, and that's how I'm going to close. The success on this project really looks like that we can um, live with fire on the landscape again. Um, not that we're ever looking for unplanned fire, um, on the landscape, but uh, this landscape was built around fire. If we can do the treatments necessary from thinning and fuel breaks from prescribed fire and mechanical treatments, um, we can uh, best allow um, fire to um, to be reintroduced into uh, into the Sara landscape. And that's hopefully mostly on our terms, meaning through prescribed fire or or if there is unplanned fire, being able to um, best protect uh, our communities, um, homes, uh, and other infrastructure therein. And so, so to end there is to say that this landscape is important to all of us. Um, this is public land. This is your land. And so looking for your feedback here, your comments, your questions. Um, as indicated earlier, we will um, go go back and look at all of these questions. We'll, we'll um, probably type up some responses. And then we'll start off next week's meeting with responding to the questions we did not address here tonight. Um, but I want to thank you all for your time. I know there's a, a county meeting starting about now that um, some of you may have interest in. Um, but thank you for what you do. Thank you for being a part of this process. Um, this process is uh, in order to make the best decision possible um, that meets uh, as many um, uh, as many needs and desires as feasible. We can't make everybody happy on everything, but we're doing our best to, to use science, to use input um, so that uh, we can protect our communities, um, protect things that we all care about. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all again next week or sometime uh, out in the community or maybe um, at a, on a hike in the woods. So, all right, with that, wish you all well. Happy 2022 and uh, with that, turn it to Katie for any last words. Oh, none. All right, with that, have a wonderful night. Uh, um, safe travels if you're going anywhere.